Are you scared of dairy? Have you been told that dairy increases your risk of fracture? Do you think that dairy is unnatural, that dairy is inflammatory? Well, some of those things might be true, but what if we're looking at this all wrong? Stick around because we're going to talk about the difference between what dairy is now versus what dairy used to be, what happened to the dairy industry around the turn of the century. And I want to quickly review some of the evidence, albeit kind of poor, around the benefit of dairy versus the harms of dairy. And definitely stick around till the end because I have a new exciting offer that I want to talk to all of our listeners about as a way to get more information about our approach to improving bone health and potentially reversing osteoporosis. Okay, so a few months ago, we did a video on this 2014 study by Dr. Walter Willett from Harvard that was really championed by Dr. Mark Hyman um, that showed that there was a 9% higher risk of hip fracture with the consumption of each glass of milk. And this was really taken out of context from this study, and I'm not going to dig into it now. You can watch that video. But the short of it is that this study and the, the discussion of it around this idea that a single glass of milk is going to increase your risk of fracture by 9% is just crazy. If you go back and look at the data, essentially they looked at data from food frequency questionnaires that were recalling what people consumed as children when they were adults. So there's obviously a lot of uh, bias and inaccuracy there. The increase in hip fracture was there, but only for men and not for women. So apparently dairy would only be negative for men and not for women. And then also the vertical increase in height was more strongly associated with that increased fracture risk than was the dairy itself. And so really all you can take out of study is that as a growing child, the dairy might increase your vertical height, which would of course, increase your fracture risk, which we already knew. So it's not necessarily the dairy and the one glass thing is very, very confusing. And recognizing that as adults, we are not growing anymore. So consuming dairy now is not the same thing as consuming dairy then. So I hope that makes sense. So check out that video if you want all the detail on that. For today, let's just talk about dairy in a different light. So I agree that dairy is not for everyone. For some people, it can be inflammatory. And that's why we recommend testing your immune system for intolerance to dairy. Most people know if they're lactose intolerant, but the other proteins in dairy, particularly whey, casein, et cetera. But here's the thing about that is why are we seeing more and more people intolerant to dairy now than it seemed like used to be? even after the pasteurization process started, and I'll talk about that later. But I think part of it is because we're sicker as a population now, we have leakier guts. But I also think that the dairy is more inflammatory. The processing, the pasteurization, the removal of dietary fat, as we start to make it more and more like a highly processed food, our bodies aren't going to respond to it like it once did. So that brings up the question then about raw dairy. And I'm gonna talk about raw dairy later, but first I wanna get into some of the evidence around dairy itself. Dairy as it stands, pasteurized, homogenized, in your grocery store, everywhere in all 50 states. And this is mostly around milk, actually. It recognized that dairy is more than milk. It is fermented dairy, it is whole fat dairy, it is cheeses. Dairy is a lot of things and some people can consume some and not the other. Dairy also comes in A2 versus A1. Uh, cow products, as well as A2 products that come from sheep and from goats, et cetera. So there's a lot of different variations that some people can tolerate and others people can't if the goal is to consume the potential benefits of dairy. So let's get into some of this research. So this first study that we pulled was a 2020 meta-analysis. So I mentioned that study that Dr. Hyman talked about a lot. That is a retrospective review of data. This is a meta-analysis of several different studies, and these are either cross-sectional or case controls, I mean, they followed them forward in time. And there was no increased risk of osteoporosis in those that consumed dairy. In fact, there was a 37% reduction in osteoporosis and a 25% reduction in fracture. But here's the thing, where was this in the media? Nobody covered this study. Everybody wanted to talk about the fear of dairy and put that out there so that if you consume one glass of milk, you're gonna have a 9% increased risk of hip fracture. This study didn't see the light of day, which is really interesting to me. This study doesn't provoke fear. So fear sells headlines. The second study I wanna talk about though, reinforces the fact that you don't necessarily have to consume milk. It's challenging because people will say, well, I can't consume milk, therefore I have osteoporosis, therefore I need to take drugs. No, 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 no. Look, dairy is unnatural. Dairy is a tool. If you go back in time, go back to 2005, there was a meta-analysis that I reviewed that looked at the risk of quote-unquote low calcium intake 
and low dairy intake and the risk of fracture. And it looked like that low intake of dairy and calcium was not associated with an increased risk of fracture. So I'm gonna say that again. You don't necessarily need to consume a high diet of calcium. You don't necessarily have to consume dairy not to develop osteoporosis, that would be silly. Our bodies didn't evolve to consume milk from another species for a long period of time, especially as an adult. Dairy is innately unnatural and possibly inflammatory. But like I said, it is a tool and it's a tool that has uh, potentially beneficial proteins and it does have calcium if you need more calcium, but osteoporosis in general is not a calcium deficiency disease. So I previously did a video, uh, which we'll also link to on what's called the milk basic proteins or MBPs. And what we can show in that study, in that video of studies is that you can reverse osteoporosis with the supplement of, of milk basic protein. Now it's subtle, just like all supplements, but it, it did independently increase bone mineral density. So what is in milk basic protein? Well, it's these things called lactoferrin, lactoperoxidase, these other things called immunoglobulins. All of these things are in MBP, as well as things like growth factors. So when you go through the process of pasteurization, guess what happens to all those things? They all go away. If you look at cow raw milk, it should have around 200 milligrams of lactoferrin per liter. If you look at the supplement of BMP, it has about 40 milligrams of lactoferrin in a, a recommended uh, dose. So then if you were to look at that raw milk and you were to think about a cup of it, you would have about 50 milligrams of lactoferrin. So that 40 milligrams of MBP is lactoferrin and all the other stuff together. So raw milk per cup would have 50 milligrams of lactoferrin. So if we look at how much of these things are in the milk that most of us have access to, the pasteurized milk, you can appreciate that there's potentially going to be more of it if they're pasteurized, like they would be um, usually on a raw farm. But the more you shift them into these concentrated animal feeding operations, you shift them away from uh, pasture and eating their, their natural food sources versus, versus um, you know, conventional grains, GMO grains, et cetera, um, you're going to reduce the concentration of dietary fat, proteins, uh, and all the other good stuff that goes into raw milk if you have it, or potentially into pasteurized milk. So the more that could go in, the more that could potentially survive pasteurization. Pasture-raised cows are going to really impact the quality of your milk versus, say, in meat. And we talk about you know grass-fed versus conventional. Grass-fed, yes, is better, but I think it's more important for milk than it is for meat. And if you are worried about what happens in the pasteurization process, like I am, there are some studies to support that. So the fourth study we have here is a 2011 systematic review of the pasteurization impact. And it does show that it significantly decreases your B12, your folate, your B1, your B2, your vitamin E, all of those things go down. Interestingly, vitamin A actually goes up, uh, which is an interesting side effect of pasteurization. Not only do those things go down, but there's actually another study, our fifth study here, shows that you lose 85% of lactoferrin. You lose the growth factors and immunoglobulins. They're just not heat stable. So they break down in the process of trying to eliminate all of the pathogens that may or may not be in the milk. So you do end up losing those things as well. All right, I'm gonna take a quick break here just to ask you a favor. If you do enjoy this content, please click the subscribe button. Helps me to promote this material to more people that are looking to optimize their bone health journey. And secondly, if you haven't already gone through our free masterclass, look for the link in the description below for this opportunity to watch either live or recorded version of this video where we go through our approach from the beginning to the end and we answer some live questions and we do this about every two to three weeks. Thousands of people have found this to be helpful. So consider joining that if you have more questions about how to manage your osteoporosis. So let's dig into some of this research or lack thereof on raw milk. Again, raw milk is milk that is produced on farms that then doesn't go through the pasteurization process. Are there big studies on raw milk? No, because production of raw milk, the sale of raw milk started to be restricted in the early 1900s. And so no good research was being done in 1900. So we don't have any good research that supported that the consumption of raw milk before the uh, elimination of it from the food source for most people. I'm going to do a full review of raw milk on the Dr. Doug show. So take a look at the Dr. Doug show, which is a different podcast, different um, kind of health span related topics not specific to bone health, but specific to health span in general. So look for the raw milk conversation on the Dr. Doug show in the next few weeks. But there are some interesting studies that we want to put there on immune improvements, some other things that raw milk have been studied on in, in smaller studies uh, as time has moved forward. The thing about raw milk is it is the only way to get a significant amount of lactoferrin and immunoglobulins. 
in a natural form. You can take supplements of those things, but always better to get it naturally if we can. So I want to give a quick background of raw dairy. So raw dairy used to be the only dairy, which makes sense. We didn't start pasteurizing things until the early 1900s. Raw dairy before the pasteurization process was used at medical institutions like the Mayo Clinic to treat what would be described at the time as uncurable diseases. Those included autoimmune diseases, GI disorders, chronic fatigue, chronic illnesses. And they did so successfully because it essentially reset the gut, healed the gut because of all the potential benefit of the immunoglobulins, the lactoferrin, and allowed people to get through some chronic diseases. And of course, these are all anecdotal reports and histories and et cetera. But, um, but it was pretty well known that this was a successful treatment option in the early 1900s. When they started pasteurizing milk, obviously this went away because now milk was stripped of a lot of its potential benefit. It became more inflammatory. So then using a milk only diet probably wouldn't be healing those things like it once did, potentially even causing those things for some people. So unfortunately, raw milk lost its healing properties and selling of raw milk became very contentious and it became a state by state thing. It was not federally restricted until actually the 1980s, but every state started to put restrictions in place as far as whether or not farms could sell raw milk. Could it be sold in a, a grocery store versus at the farm or not at all? There are now laws around interstate sales, so that's federally restricted. And inside each state, again, sometimes the rules are that you can't sell it at all. Sometimes you can sell it to pets uh, and not to humans. So lots of different variables from state to state, and I'm not sure about other countries. The challenge has been for people that believe that we should have the right to choose what we eat is that when it comes to raw dairy, if you find it really helpful and the government makes it illegal because of a concern for safety, we should be able to, as consumers, evaluate that safety. Unfortunately, we do have that data. So I just want to run through some of it with you because everything comes with potential risk. So the CDC currently says that you should consume any raw dairy with caution. And again, in some states, it's not even available and that it's considered, quote unquote, dirty because of these outbreak illnesses that can be associated with raw dairy. So let me just run through a couple of recent years. So we have data from 2015, I think through 2017 listed here for you. And so the 2015 data shows that raw dairy, actually raw and pasteurized dairy together caused 116 cases throughout the country. That was about 3% of quote unquote outbreak illnesses. If you looked at cases of outbreak illnesses associated with seeded vegetables, there were 1,121 illnesses. That was 26% of outbreak illnesses. So in 2015, you were way more likely to get sick from eating veggies than you were from dairy. Same thing in 2016, where we compared dairy at 7% of outbreak illnesses to grains and beans, which was 10% of outbreak illnesses. And in 2017, dairy was back down to 2% and fruits were at 14%. So I just bring this up to say that everything has potential risk and that includes processed food, fruits, beans, grains, and vegetables. It's hard to raise food in a bacteria-free environment. And so there's always risk and you really have to understand where you're getting your food from. Okay, so what about fermentation? Well, fermentation has the potential to be beneficial. We know that it does potentially add good bacteria back into the food product and when consumed, it can reduce inflammation. We know that non-fermented and pasteurized dairy tends to be inflammatory, whereas fermented kefir, for example, we found a study on, does reduce CRP and, and looks to be anti-inflammatory. So some interesting changes there simply from bacteria, but we also don't know in those studies, was it the fermentation process or was it the, the raw starting point? It's a little hard to know. Again, there's just not enough studies on this. So in conclusion, my thoughts on dairy is that it clearly does not increase the risk of fracture in, I would say, probably most people, the vast majority of people. It is unnatural. We are the only species that consumes milk from another species. So I totally get that argument against dairy. It may also be inflammatory for some people, which would obviously then be negative for their bones. But if you consume dairy that you can tolerate and you can test that, you can heal your gut and you could probably tolerate more. If you have access to raw milk, I think it's fantastic. Myself and my, my kids drink it. We also drink colostrum. We put colostrum in the milk and we drink that together. And we've seen really significant benefits from that. I think the raw milk likely would improve fracture risk, but I can't say that with any evidence to support it. I think that there is definitely some value in lactoferrin, the growth factors, because if you look at studies on milk basic protein, we can see that even if you put them back in synthetically, you're going to see that benefit. So I think there's probably other benefits to raw milk as well. And of course, you can go to the Dr. Doug show in a couple of weeks and you can see that full video there to check that out.
If you haven't already gone through our Bone Foundations course, listen to this. We used to sell this Bone Foundations course because we wanted to offer something for people to get through on their own time outside of our full service uh, program, but getting a lot of the same information. Now we're giving this away for free. So to get access, look for the link in the description below, but you have access then to all of the modules of which we're always continuing to increase right now. There's 16 different modules on how to improve bone health and potentially reverse osteoporosis. We have a workbook that goes along with it. We have nutrition guides that you'll have access to. It gives you access to our ebook, it gives you a free month of our HealthSpan Nation, which is where we do a weekly Q&A for members of the HealthSpan Nation with myself or a team member. This is where we have private members only community. We have discounts for affiliate products and services. And in 2024, we're going to start adding some content vault that you would then have access to as well. So no reason not to jump into this thing. It is again, absolutely free. And I strongly recommend that everybody get in there if you have an interest in bone health and health spin. I'll see you on the next video.